Today is from chapter 23. You can find that in your pew Bible on page 828. We're continuing our sermon series on what it means to follow Jesus. And today we are looking at how you can fake following Jesus. How you can do it hypocritically and the, the dire warnings uh, that Jesus gives to those who take this route. Uh, Jesus does not mince words in this text. So hear the word of the Lord. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others, you blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, and the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. 
O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, these are the harshest words uh, that I can think of that Jesus speaks in the scriptures. He is very blunt against, this, uh, against the hypocrisy that he sees of the religious people of his day. And so, Lord, uh, show us where we need to change so that we do not suffer the same fate that these people suffer in this passage. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. During my time in seminary, I invited a girl to come to church with me. Uh, she was hesitant at first because um, her lifestyle didn't quite fit in with the lifestyle of church. And so jokingly, I told her, look, the key to church is this. Just come into church, tell them what a horrible sinner you are, and don't specify any of the horrible sin sins that you've done, and they'll think you're the most righteous person on the face of the earth. Now, I was being joking, I was kidding around, I wasn't serious, but there is a certain painful degree of truth to what I did tell this girl. I mean, if you go out in our culture today, we hear all the time that the church is full of hypocrites. In fact, when they interview people outside of the church, uh, when Barna interviewed people outside of the church, they found that 85% would agree with the statement that the church is full of hypocrites. In fact, there's another stat I've heard uh, several times recently. I don't know the exact origin of this statistic, but what they say is that 60% of the people have already made up their mind not to attend our church. Now, when I say our church, I'm not specifically saying Calvary Presbyterian Church itself, but any church in general, they've already made up their mind not to attend because they want nothing to do with us. And so we see our culture is passing judgment on the church with their non-attendance. So much so that I think it is unfair to say that the church is full of hypocrites. I think now, because of the non-attendance, it's only half full of hypocrites. Well, this raises an important question. What specifically is a hypocrite? Jesus gives the definition uh, when describing the religious leaders of his day. He says, for they preach, but do not practice. In other words, they're the people who say, do what I say, not what I do. And the motive for this hypocrisy is they are using religion as a means of giving themselves the status of goodness, to get praise for themselves. Now, it's important to know that what hypocrisy is not. It is not somebody who sins, uh, admits it, and repents. That is not a hypocrite. Kids, your children may have done wild and crazy things when they were your age, and they may be telling you not to do the wild and crazy things that they did at that age. If they have repented of those wild and crazy things, they are not hypocrites. Well, how does Jesus want you to respond to hypocrites? Well, in this passage, he basically says, do what they say, not what they do. Think of it this way. Let's assume that Oscar the Grouch were up here preaching a sermon today. And let's say he was preaching a sermon on the need to be filled with joy through the Holy Spirit. He would be a hypocrite, but he'd also be right. And so you need to be on God's side, no matter how many hypocrites are on that side as well. But the main thrust of Jesus' uh, Jesus's words in this text are his response to those who are hypocrites. And this is where when people tell me the church is full of hypocrites, I, I always respond, then you would love Jesus. 
because his entire ministry was him at war with the religious hypocrites of his day, culminating in this passage right here where he condemns to the utmost their hypocrisy. And here he is giving some very blunt, very tough love to the religious hypocrites of his day. And to really summarize what Jesus is saying is, um, is this. Repent of your religious hypocrisy or you will be damned. That's bluntly what Jesus is saying in this passage. Repent of your religious hypocrisy or you will be damned. His words are so extreme that we need to look at ourselves, at our hearts, and see do we fall into any, any of the categories he critiques here? Well, basically, he gives several examples of religious hypocrisy that is going on at, in his day. And the, these can, I think, really be summarized by saying uh, that the, your hypocrisy is a rejection of God's lordship. Uh, there was a, a scene in the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade uh, if you remember that movie, Indiana Jones was trying to find the Holy Grail. And a man questions him at one point. He says, why do you seek the cup of Christ? Is it for his glory or for yours? And that's really the question that Jesus is asking as he gives this critique. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it for his glory or is it for yours? And so he gives six examples of religious hypocrisy in here, each one of which could cover an entire sermon. And so I actually decided to do six sermons today. We're going to be here till 2.30, 3 o'clock. I won't do that to you. Um, but the first one is that we, we reject God's lordship by stealing his steps. In Matthew 23, 12, he says, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And he critiques the religious leaders of his day for seeking the place of honor at feasts, seeking the best seats at the synagogue, and desiring titles like rabbi. So how do we know if we're falling into this trap where we're trying to steal God's status? How well do you handle being snubbed? Maybe you didn't get the promotion at work. Maybe you didn't get the raise you wanted. Maybe you did something praiseworthy, but you weren't praised, you were overlooked. How do you handle that? When we have a guest in the church, are you more likely to greet that guest if you know that they're a Westminster student? If you are seeking status, because there are titles of status that we can acquire in this world, are you doing it for the expanded opportunity to serve are you, or are you doing it for the increased respect that you can now demand? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves to determine whether we're trying to steal God's lordship through by stealing his status. Another way we reject God's lordship is by stealing his praise. In Matthew 23, 5, Jesus says, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. He gives the example of phylacteries. I won't go into detail what that is, but it's basically the WWJD bracelet of its day. Um, but he contrasts this in the Sermon on the Mount with another phrase he says. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus says, Let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so are you doing your good deeds so that you will be praised, or are you doing your good deeds so that God will be praised? This is something I wrestle with every time I step up here to preach. Do I want to hear you guys tell me after the sermon, hey, that was a good sermon, Jay? Or do I want to hear, want to hear you guys tell me, hey, that's a great God we serve? That's something an internal struggle I wrestle with often. Well, how do you know if you're guilty of this hypocrisy? Well, here are some questions you can ask yourself. Do you, good, do you do good deeds when there is no one around to praise you? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives the example of prayer, giving to the poor, and fasting. We're all either really good at 
not uh, with the fasting one, or we're all not fasting, but the other two, prayer and giving to the poor, do we do that when others aren't watching? Also, do you do your good deeds when you're around company who doesn't appreciate it? You know, we can praise God with our loud voices on Sunday, but what are we like when we're around our coworkers on Monday? Are we praising him there as well, or do we just give God the silent treatment when we're there? Are you more concerned about what people think of you than you are about what they think of God? These are the questions that are raised when we try to steal God's praise. The third thing we do is we reject his lordship by adding burdens. Uh, Matthew 23, 4, Jesus says, They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Jesus is here specifically referring to the oral law. Now, God revealed his law to the people in the first five books of the Bible. But the, uh, the uh, religious leaders of that day also added an oral law to it that they said was equally as divine and put heavy burdens on the people. Well, what might be some of the burdens that we put on uh, people today? I think one that God has really placed on my heart and has really been working with me to change is how do we react to those outside of the Christian faith? Are we uh, exclusively saying, come grow our church, or are we also adding to that, also go and make disciples? Because often if we're exclusively doing come grow our church, we're telling them, you need to come to us, you need to come on our time, you need to come into our own cultural setting where we're comfortable, you need to come in with a group of complete strangers who may or may not welcome you depending on you know, who you're sitting around. But when we go make disciples, we are actually taking the initiative to go to them. We're doing it on their time. We're doing it in their cultural setting, not our own. We're the one who's entering into a group of complete strangers. And we're the ones who may or may not be welcomed. And so much of our church has been designed to do the former and not do the latter. And we need to be doing both. The fourth way that we can reject God's lordship is with misplaced priorities. There, that really is, that could be a sermon right there. But uh, Matthew 23, 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Well, you know what your priorities are by what you measure. Um, in most churches, we, uh, on a weekly basis, we measure attendance and money. And that's a good thing to do. We need to do that. We're glad for the people who do that. But if that's all a church is doing, if that's all they're measuring, then they have some serious priority problems going on there that they need to repent of. But what are you measuring in your own life? What are you seeking to measure? That tells you where your priorities are and whether they're misplaced or not. Fifth, we reject God's lordship by breaking oaths. In Matthew 23, 16, it says, Woe to you, blind guides, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. Now, this time, of course, as it is today, when you make an oath, you're making a promise that you intend to keep. But what the... Uh, the religious leaders of that day were, is they were making oaths as loopholes so they wouldn't actually have to keep the promise that they made. And it showed the worldly priorities they had as well because they would say, okay, well, if you swear by the temple, it's not binding, but if you swear by the gold of the temple, it is binding. So what do they value? Do they value the temple where God dwells or do they value the gold? And so it exposes that their treasure is not in heaven, it is on earth. Well, we do have oaths that we take today, but the essence of what Jesus says in response to this is, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Keep your word. Now, the way we try to avoid keeping our word is we make excuses. Um, you know, we make the excuse, well, I'm, I'm too busy. 
uh, to do what God says is a priority. Uh, there was one uh, church planter whose name's uh, Jeff Sundell. He says, this is the sin of the church. Busyness is the sin of the church today. Um, we can say, well, I'm, I'm not called to do this. It's, it's somebody else's job. We, we outsource what God has specifically called us to do. Um, I'm grateful for the work Mike Nowling and Darren Bacon do in teaching scripture to our children, and they should be a great asset to you parents. But if you're not also entering in uh, to disciple your children yourself, then you are guilty of doing this. I think there's also kind of a snobbery as well uh, that can be an excuse where somebody's trying to do something good in the church and we won't pitch in because it's not good enough. You know, well, he, he's doing it that way and it should be done more like this way, so I'm not gonna participate. And so instead of coming alongside a brother or sister to assist them in what they're doing, we just sit on the sidelines. The sixth is we reject God's lordship with superficial righteousness. Matthew 23, 28 says, So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And Jesus points to the cup and plate that are clean on the outside, but have greed and self-indulgence on the inside. And then he points to the whitewashed tombs that were clean on the outside, but inside had dead men's bones. And it's understandable that you would take this approach if you're seeking to exclusively get praise from men, because men cannot see your thoughts. They cannot see into your heart, so all you have to do is have a superficial level of righteousness for other people. But if you're seeking praise for God, he can see the inside, and so that takes on value for you. So here's some tough questions for us on this one. Is your behavior in private consistent with your behavior in public? When you do sin, are you more concerned that you offended God or that you might get caught? What would you think if we were able to look at your internet browsing over the last month? Would you be comfortable coming back here next Sunday? Those are the questions we need to ask to determine if we're falling short in this area or not. And so if you are finding that you are rejecting God and rejecting his lordship, what this means is that your rejection makes you an enemy of Christ. In verse 34, Jesus says, Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. Now these persecutions that are described were specifically fulfilled in Christ's own ministry, who was the greatest prophet to ever live. He was crucified. He was flogged. He was persecuted from town to town as the, uh, as the, the religious leaders tried to discredit him and plotted to kill him. And, it was, and these were all fulfilled throughout the ministry of his apostles, throughout the book of Acts, every single one of them. And it's understandable why that would be, because if you take the perspective of your, in your spiritual life, hallowed be my name, because I'm seeking status, I'm seeking praise, that's going to put you in conflict with the one who says that you need to pray, hallowed be thy name. And if you're saying, my will be done, by saying, well, I'm only going to hold to a superficial standard of righteousness, or I'm going to put my priorities over God's priorities, that's going to put you into conflict with the one who tells you to pray, thy will be done. Have you ever taken that moment to step back and said, say, you know, it, we all love Jesus, but have you ever stopped to, to say, Wait a minute, if Jesus were here today and he were actually, if I were holding a conversation with him, would I really actually like him? Because we have like the Jesus in our mind of who we think Jesus is, but then there's like the real life Jesus who might not meet those expectations. I mean, imagine if Jesus were a pastor of a church in America. Would we actually like him? At first we would because large crowds would come to him because he'd be healing them. But then people would get frustrated with his sermons because he'd be speaking in parables and they'd have no idea what he's talking about. But then he'd start telling you things about 
your level of commitment to him. He'd say, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Which is usually comfortable to hear in a sermon, but if he actually walks up to you and tells you the specific area you need to specifically deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him on, then it gets kind of uncomfortable. And then he says, Things like, follow me and I will make you fishers of men and you will be flogged and dragged before governors and kings and you will be chased from one town to the next. And all of a sudden, all those crowds that were coming would be dispersed because Jesus is demanding that following him be their highest priority. Now this is actually genius on Jesus' part because then he can fully focus all his attention on discipling the fully committed, and he won't have himself stretched thin discipling those who are only half-hearted, and when it comes time to really uh, follow him, we'll just go by the wayside. But at the same time, you can imagine the elders of the church walking up to him and saying, Jesus, we've just lost half our congregation. How are we going to pay for this building? At which point Jesus would say, go sell everything and give to the poor, then come follow me. And he'd probably get fired. And the church would be guilty of kicking Jesus out of his own church. Because we would rather my will be done than thy will be done. Well, because you are an enemy, Jesus warns that you will be damned. He says, woe to you throughout this passage, seven times in this passage, this is a statement of damnation. You don't want to hear Jesus saying woe to you when he's speaking specifically to you. And in Matthew 23, 38, he says, see your house is left to you desolate. What Jesus is actually doing is referring back to Leviticus chapter 26. Um, In the book of Leviticus chapter 26, the Israelites have received God's law from Mount Sinai, and they are about to go into the promised land. And God gives the people the curses that will come upon them if they disobey his law upon entering the promised land. And what he says in that warning is that he would punish their sin sevenfold. And so we see that with the seven woes in chapter 23. And he says that they will be left desolate and driven out of the land. And so we see Jesus saying, see your house is left to you desolate. And this is fulfilled 40 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when Jerusalem is destroyed and the Jewish people are kicked out of Jerusalem for over 1,900 years. But more importantly, it's uh, fulfilled, we see in verse 33 in this way, when Jesus says, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Because if we reject God relationally, We cannot go back to him and then demand the blessings that come from that relationship. It's like a husband who divorces his wife and then gets upset when the wife doesn't get him an anniversary present. You don't get it both ways. You either fully embrace God and receive his blessings, or if you reject him, you reject the blessings as well. As Jonathan Edwards once said, you will either actively glorify God in your obedience or you will passively glorify God in your destruction. So because you are an enemy, you will be damned. And so you need to flee damnation by coming to Christ in repentance. You see this in Matthew 23, 37, verse 37. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Jerusalem at this time was not willing to come to Jesus. Are you willing? Because when you come to Jesus, when you reject making yourself Lord and you trust in Him as your Lord and you trust in His death on the cross for your forgiveness, what that means is that you are now credited with His perfect obedience to God's commands and you are credited, you are given the blessings that that perfect obedience grants you. 
And so what that means is that when God looks at you, he sees you as perfectly obedient whether you are or not. And so there is no need to put on an act. Because God sees you as perfectly good. There is no way you can be more obedient in God's eyes, could be seen as more obedient in God's eyes than you are already if your faith is in Jesus Christ. And as you trust in Jesus, God changes you from the inside out so that you will repent and stop doing the bad things and start doing the good things. And as this happens, you are molded more and more into the character of Jesus Christ. And how did Jesus respond to the hypocrisies in his own life? Where did he fall when it came to stealing God's status? Well, he is the one who did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. What about stealing God's praise? He was the one who was willing to be mocked on the cross to lead men to praise God. What about adding burdens to people? He's the one who said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what about breaking oaths? Well, all God's promises are yes in Christ Jesus. There's a movie that came out last year called Lee Daniels, The Butler. For those of you who did see it, I did not, so forgive me if I get any facts wrong. Um, but the point of this movie is that there was, the main character is a butler. This is not particularly a title of status. When kids are growing up, they, you know, they say, oh, I want to be president, I want to be a doctor, I want to be an astronaut. They, they don't generally say, I want to be a butler. So it's not a title of status. So why would they make a movie out of a butler? What made him so significant? Well, what made him significant is that he served eight U.S. presidents. It was not his status, but who he served that gave him value. And it's the same with us in Jesus Christ. We can humble ourselves. We can, uh, we can uh, let Jesus be Lord as he, we can acknowledge his lordship because our value comes from serving him not from exalting ourselves and using religious uh, the religious things of our life to seek to glorify ourselves so repent of your religious hypocrisy or you will be damned I want to take a moment before I pray to just ask you you know, as you reflect on this passage, where do you need to change here? Um, do you try to steal God's status? Do you try to steal his praise? Uh, do you try to add burdens? Do you have misplaced priorities? Do you make excuses? Um, do you have a superficial righteousness? And I want you to take a moment to decide what are you specifically going to do this week to change? Um, for me, I find that I'm often more concerned about what people think of me than about what they think of God. And one of the things that God has been putting on my heart and I haven't actually done is to, when I'm going out, when I'm out in the community, when I'm in Panera, is talking to the person at the, the counter, I don't actually, uh, you know, one of the things he's put on my heart is to ask them how I can pray for them. And I haven't been doing it because I'm more concerned about what they think of me than I am what they think of God. So my commitment to this sermon is to ask five people this week outside of church how I can pray for them. That's my commitment. So take a moment, think about what your commitment will be on this. Let me pray for you before you do that. Heavenly Father, there are areas where we need to repent, Lord. We all feel that struggle of hypocrisy between ourselves being praised and God being praised. Uh, between us getting status or you having status, between your will or our will. Show us where we need to change. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's take a moment to silently consider where you need to change.